Let us pray. God, we are grateful for your word. We pray that you give us ears to hear, that we might be filled with comfort just as we are filled with conviction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The part about preaching I like best is the prep work. I just love getting a Bible passage and then nerding out as I spend several days chewing on it, researching it, meditating on it. I love learning about the historical context of a passage, learning a little bit about the Greek and the Hebrew meanings of certain words. It is a privilege to study the scripture, and I always lament that I can't share all of the things I learn in one 20-minute sermon. But every once in a while, I get a text that when I read it, I say to God, oh, Lord, not this one. This passage is too challenging, maybe because the story doesn't immediately grab me, or maybe I get a a passage that is going to need a lot of research on a week when I'm just super busy, or... Maybe I get a passage that just feels too emotionally hard. And friends, I confess that this was the case with the passage today. I read it and I said, oh Lord, please not today. I even double-checked the lectionary that Pastor Carl was just talking about, and um, just to make sure I hadn't made a mistake for this week, but there it was, Luke 23, 33 through 43, the account of Jesus' torture and execution. Now, I know this account is a foundational part of Christianity. We don't get the resurrection without the death, There is no Easter without Good Friday. But this part is like when I close my eyes during a scary part of a scary movie. I want to look away when I read about Jesus' torture and death. Oh Lord, please, not this one today. But I have been on this planet long enough to know that there is no real growth if you don't sit with discomfort for a while. So let us dive in together. First, let's start with the beginning, when Jesus begins his ministry. The message and work of Jesus throughout the book of Luke is laser-focused. Jesus ruptures the evil powers and principalities that have gripped creation since our fall in the garden described in Genesis. The incarnation of Jesus is about the resurrection from that fall. From the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus minces no words in explaining what the work of his father is about and what Jesus is going to do about it. We hear about it in Luke 4. So imagine a synagogue service, a gathering of folks worshiping God just like we are worshiping God here today. Each of us have our stories. Each of us carry things that lives that we long for God to touch, for God to heal, for God to make right. Now for those of us today, We have the gift of the freedom of religion. We fully expect that our pastors, elders, and other leaders have the freedom and the desire to speak and offer God's truth to us. But that is not quite the case in synagogue services in the time of the Roman occupation. Rome is watching this minority people group. They have reason to. The Jewish people are taxed to the point of poverty, and because of this, there is a class system. 
Everyday people who pay taxes to the point of being impoverished are on the bottom. And the upper middle class are those who learn how to play the political game and have found crafty ways to work the system. And these folks include the religious leaders, the Sadducees, chief priests, and Pharisees. So there is this carefully manipulated dance where the Sadducees, priests, and Pharisees are trying to sedate the masses enough to keep them from rebelling against Rome and, frankly, against any disruption in the bit of lavishness they've been able to work for in the system. And the religious leaders are being closely watched by Rome. And adding to the friction is that the Jewish religion is barely tolerated and is even openly mocked by Roman soldiers on the regular. In fact, in just a few years from this point, their new emperor, Caligula, will require all religious institutions, including synagogues, to have portraits of him posted inside and require the people to worship him. So occupied Israel has to be very careful about what they do and say, lest they rock the boat too much and get the attention of Caesar and Rome, who will annihilate them if their actions get too rebellious. Well, one day, in the synagogue, that all changes. Jesus that curious and headstrong son of Mary and Joseph that they all know goes to worship like he does most weeks, except today it's different. Jesus stands up, walks to the front. He opens a scroll from Isaiah, and he begins to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he ends with this zinger. He scans the room. And he makes eye contact with those sitting in the pews. Lingering a little longer with the chief priests and the leaders before saying, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Then he rolls up the scroll, puts it back, and sits down. Jesus' version of a mic drop. you could have heard a pin drop. Hope and faith, and maybe even righteous anger, ignited in the hungry bellies of the impoverished. But for a few, the chief priests and leaders, this was danger. You can just see them tugging at their collars, squirming in their seats, and giving each other a few meaningful glances, this was not going to end well. These were fighting words. Jesus was a wrecking ball pointed at the systems that fed the greed of a few at the cost of the lives of many. The conviction and repentance he sparked in the souls of even the tax collectors were a threat to those who benefited from the subjugation of God's people. Impassioned, hungry, excited crowds of people began following Jesus around. He heals those the leaders wanted out. He teaches them that in God's reign, the last are to be first. He uses that same scriptures the leaders abuse to keep others silent as a key to unlocking their shackles for freedom, to flourish, worship, grow, and equip them for change. The crowds get bigger and louder 
And the magnifying glass on the religious leaders in the Roman Empire begins to smolder into flame. What could be next? Revolution? So the chief priests and religious leaders sell out Jesus to the big evil, Rome, to have him executed. But even in his moment of torturous death, Jesus cannot be silenced. He is filled with purpose and love and mission. He is the living representation of the radicalness of nonviolence in a tsunami of violence. Jesus is a proclamation of love, asking God to forgive these soldiers, even as they sat there gambling for his clothes. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus understood that though these men were doing Rome's bidding, they were caught in a system they didn't understand and they were too blind to see. They were cogs in a wheel. They didn't know Jesus was the Son of God. They didn't know that his death would fulfill a work that was much bigger than anything they could do. In the middle of agony, Jesus offers forgiveness to those who don't know they need it. One of the most challenging aspects of modern American Christianity is deciding who we are in biblical narratives. There are many like me, white, relatively affluent, able-bodied folks who latch on to those who are oppressed in Scripture. We imagine ourselves as David battling the Goliath of anti-Christian government, media, and Hollywood. We see ourselves as the Jewish people needing to turn the other cheek when someone cuts us off in line at Safeway. We believe taking up our cross and following Jesus happens when the Starbucks barista misspells my name Karen with a K instead of a C on my cup, yet I walk away and say have a blessed day anyway. It feels good to be the underdog. But being an American Christian is way more complicated than that. The reality is there are some who hear this story and immediately resonate with the crucified Jesus. And then there are some who listen, who need conviction that they might be the Roman soldier. Some, like Jesus, have been the target and victim of the greed of empire, the colonizer, the government. Some, like Roman soldiers, are oblivious to the ways we participate in the oppression of others. Some know all too well that Jesus was unjustly chased down, beat, captured, tortured, and murdered for something he didn't do, and some are so checked out that they go about their own ways of gambling, choosing comfort, our own neighborhoods, our own power, our own ways of working the system as if they were given to us by God instead of Caesar. We numb ourselves to the reality of others around us because just like the Roman soldiers, we can Just like I have the privilege of choosing to ignore this passage today. Being an American Christian is complicated indeed. In his seminal book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, theologian James H. Cohn says this, The cross can heal and hurt. It can be empowering and liberating, but also enslaving and oppressive. 
There is no one way in which the cross can be interpreted. I offer my reflections because I believe that the cross placed alongside the lynching tree can help us to see Jesus in America in new light and thereby empower people who claim to follow him to take a stand against white supremacy and every kind of injustice. I must not look away from the cross. You must not look away from the cross. The church must not look away from the cross because there are too many among us who cannot look away from the cross. Church, the cross is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. And we must not look away, not now, not ever. Not if we want to understand what God is doing in our world. Not if we want to grow in our walk with God. Not if we want to participate in God's good work of justice that is bringing shalom. Not if we want to live a life of purpose, of connection, of nonviolent love. Not if we want to say we want to live in beloved community. Not if we say black lives matter. No, the cross orients us to what is at stake once we give our lives to God, and what is at stake is a complete gutting of everything that stands in the way of release for the captives, recovery of sight, good news for the poor, freedom for the oppressed, and jubilee for all creation. Jesus' life is way too precious to be cheapened for anything less. Church, do you hear the good news? And this is where it starts. This is the foundation of the expensive gift we are given at the cross. This is how we rip the flag of white supremacy down from the steeple of Christ's church. This is how we recover our sight. This is how we pick up the baton of release, freedom, and run our race towards jubilee. This is where we receive the power, the strength to participate in God's radical renewal of his creation. It starts with forgiveness. Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Just like those Roman soldiers didn't know yet how they were participating in systemic oppression, neither do we. There is so much we are doing that hurts others, and we don't even know about it yet. But church, we are forgiven. God forgives us not to forgive and forget, but so we can be forgiven and remember. Remember who we belong to. Remember who we were created to be. Remember whose we are and receive God's good and convicting Holy Spirit who loves us too much to let us keep doing things that hurt the beloved community. Remember that though we fail, our belonging to God, our belonging to each other, and our belonging to ourselves through these holy waters of baptism is what empowers us to get up dust ourselves off, and do it again. Remember and discover and learn and step into God or godly identity to love with truth and conviction and sacrifice and humility and to keep doing it until we finally arrive at God's day when all shall be well. And on that day, 
when justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream, that day is coming. Church, we are forgiven. Now let us remember. Let us pray. God, We are grateful for you. We are grateful for the work that happened at the cross. We have a gratefulness that defies words, that defies understanding as to why that happened, why that way was the way that you sent your son to be died and then to be resurrected. But we are so incredibly grateful for that work. And we pray that the understanding of that and the newness of that will fill us to go about doing your very good work. That the offering of our gifts, um, of all that we are, of our sacrifices, will fill us with purpose and connection and that we would become your beloved community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.